Welcome to Worship Friends on the third Sunday of the Easter season. I'm Pastor Jennifer Ginn, or PG as I am known to many, coming to you this morning from my home. I wish I could see your faces, but this will have to do for now. I serve Cross and Crown Lutheran Church in Matthews, North Carolina. If you are joining us and don't know this congregation, we'd love to greet you personally. And so maybe when we are meeting again at the church, you will join us in worship. Thanks to all who are here to worship. Thanks to all who are giving financially to the life of our church as we continue during this time to honor our commitments to ministries within the congregation and the community and to our staff. We also ask for your continued prayers and are grateful for those you have already offered as we navigate this new way of being church together at a distance, but still one in the body of Christ. As worship begins, a reminder to those on our email list that you were sent a bulletin you can use to participate in the service. But even without that, I invite you now all to come into worship fully and know that God is with us as we do. Now we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our worship starts with a thanksgiving for the gift of baptism. So I invite you to join me in an Alleluia. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are raised with him to new life. Let us give thanks now for the gift of baptism. We pray. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning you created us in your image and planted us in a well-watered garden. In the desert you promised pools of water for the parched, and you gave us water from the rock. When we did not know the way, you sent the Good Shepherd, to lead us to still waters. At the cross, you watered us from Jesus' wounded side, and on this day, you shower us again with the water of life. We praise you for your salvation through water and for all water everywhere. Bathe us in your forgiveness, grace, and love. Satisfy the thirsty and give us the life only you can give. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O oh God, your Son makes himself known to us through the scriptures, the breaking of bread, and his Spirit's presence among us. Open the eyes of our faith that we may see him in his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As we prepare now to receive the gospel story from Luke, I want to give you just a bit of background. In this story, we meet two followers of Jesus who are leaving Jerusalem in the late afternoon, headed toward Emmaus. They are fleeing Jerusalem because of fear and despair at the death of their Lord Jesus. The body has been found missing from the tomb, and they are confused and frightened. And so I invite you now to come into this story with me as I tell it to you. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. On that same day, two of them were going toward Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all the things that had happened in these days. And as they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. He said to them, what are you discussing with each other as you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. 
Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place in these days? He asked them, What things? And they replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we, we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. And besides all this, it is now the third day since all these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Then some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Son of Man should suffer all these things and then come into his glory? And then beginning with Moses and all the scriptures, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. When they came near to the town to which they were going, he began to walk ahead as if he were going on. They urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, broke and blessed it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? And that same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed and he has appeared to Simon. And then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I have to say that the words those two followers of Jesus said as they described their despair to the stranger who met them, I can't get them out of my head. But we had hoped, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. As we begin week six of COVID-19 shutdown, I realize I've heard those very words recently and often. Someone said to me, we had so hoped to be in the church on Easter morning. Another, we had hoped to be with her in the hospital, but not even family could go in. Another said, I had hoped they'd start layoffs with the latest hired, not with us long timers. And another, I had hoped to see my grandson graduate this spring. Those two on the Emmaus Road had had their hopes crushed, and after it was clear that all was lost, they hightailed it out of town. If they could just get away for a little while, they'd feel lighter, freer, and maybe they could forget. Scholar and author C.S. Lewis, coping with the death of his wife, Joy, said that he at first 
had tried to avoid the places they loved to go together, their favorite pub, their usual path on morning walks, their picnic spot near the lake. But he found he could not escape his grief. Her absence, her absence, he said, is like the sky spread over everything. It's true, you know, I've tried at times to escape grief or disappointment. I've tried to escape recently loneliness and isolation. Lloyd and I at home together now long to get out. He'll say to me, let's take a ride. That man loves to drive. So we get in the car and he drives. It doesn't really matter where. For a few minutes, we escape, but not really. The heaviness of shelter in place is like the sky spread over everything. That's what those two that day on the road to Emmaus find out. They'd hoped for a break from the sadness and disappointment of Jesus' death. But even on the road headed away from Jerusalem, they can't stop talking about it. It's like the sky spread over everything. When Jesus meets up with them, he comes quietly, matching his steps to theirs. Apparently, the usual fear of strangers on a lonely road doesn't even occur to them. There's something friendly and warm about him. He gently invites them to open up, pacing his questions carefully so as to draw out their story. He meets them right where they are and walks with them side by side, like any good psychotherapist would. Turns out, though, he's not a psychotherapist at all, but a savior. The rest of the story moves quickly. He goes in to stay with them, breaks and blesses bread at the table, and their eyes are open to recognize him, and then in an instant, he's gone. But they know, they know, they knew all along. He is the risen Lord Jesus. Immediately, they head back to Jerusalem, not at the slow pace they traveled before, but this time a breathless dash. It's pitch dark by now. No Jew in his right mind would start out on a seven-mile journey in the dark and dare to think that he'd make it to Jerusalem without being robbed or beaten. But those two, they have no fear. What a contrast to the journey away from Jerusalem, slow and painful, heavy with grief, like the sky spread over everything. From heaviness to lightness, their steps now are quick and fueled with joy. They are changed. It's a dramatic story full of love and truth. But there's one thing here. It's not only about them. When we hear biblical stories, often we can stand outside the story and take sides with this character or that one. We can wonder how one person can be so dense when we see what he should have. Outside looking in, it's easy to assume the story's not about us at all. But friends, this story, this story is about us 2,000 years down the road from Resurrection Day. Because those two guys weren't members of the chosen ring of 12. They didn't stick around to help plan the next steps after the news got out that Jesus' body was missing from the tomb. They were not heroes. They literally fled the scene. And add to that, Emmaus wasn't even a significant enough place to hold its position in history. Historians aren't even sure exactly where it was. And those two guys? Well, one was named Cleopas, but the other didn't have a name. You've seen the paintings. What you see in the paintings of the road to Emmaus is their backs, not their faces. They can't be identified. We know Jesus is the one in the white robe, but the others? They are nothing more than two faithful nobodies. And that's the point, you see. That's exactly what most of us are. Faithful nobodies. <laughs> From Charlotte or Matthews, 
Waxhaw or Indian Trail or Salisbury. Just trying to hold on to our faith in the midst of a pandemic, during this forced separation from church, extended family, friends, all of them things that in the best times can be for us the hands and feet of Christ, the assurance of faith. Come to think of it, maybe that's exactly how those two on the road felt. Jesus and the flesh was gone from them, and none of their friends could be sure, really sure, that they'd seen him in resurrected form. Their flesh and blood connection to him was gone, and they had nothing to hold on to. But look what happened. Jesus showed up. Jesus met them in their despair and walked them back to life again, to new hope and purpose, a complete turnaround. And that is a promise for us, for you and for me. The risen Christ shows up. He meets us on the path. Wherever we're headed, wherever we are, in celebration or mourning, in health or sickness, even in pandemic, Jesus meets us there. I can't say exactly how it will happen, but here's a truth that isn't spoken often enough. Now more than ever, we need to hear it. It's a gift given in our baptism and one that God also mysteriously gives in ways even beyond our religious boundaries. It's the gift of Christ in us. The Christ in us can be sensed and even heard. Now, my problem is that I have so much noise in my own head. It's hard to hear anything but that. It takes practice for me to clear out that noise and hear the silence. Sometimes outside, where the sounds are wind or birds singing or the rustle of branches, if I open myself to hear those sounds, sometimes I sense that voice of Christ, warm, gentle, compelling, and in its quietness, so very powerful. Maybe you've heard it, too. If you long for that, do what those despairing followers of Jesus did. Take a walk or go for a drive or sit for a while on the back porch. Now, don't expect that to take away the loneliness or disappointment, though those two guys tried that on the road to Emmaus and their disappointment went right along with them. But something else did too, the risen Christ. That gift is not reserved for special Christians. So if you want to hear the whisper of Christ, Honor that longing. Keep listening. It is a presence deeper and more loving than any flesh and blood body could provide. And once you begin to sense it, then no matter where you go, no matter how deep your sadness, that whisper will return. And so will joy. Joy like the sky spread over everything. For that we say, thanks be to God. Amen. Our hymn this morning, and I'm so glad we have a hymn, is led by Roger and Terry Strom and accompanied by Elaine Miller. It may be a new hymn for you, but you'll catch on quickly to the tune, and so I invite you to sing along.
Will you join me now in the prayers of intercession? Uplifted by the promised hope of healing and resurrection, we join the people of God in all times and places in praying for the church, the world, and all who are in need. We pray for those whose hearts are fervent with love for your good news, that they are empowered to tell the story of your love in their lives and respond to it in hospitality to others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the diverse natural world, for jungles, prairies, forests, valleys, mountains, and for all the wild and endangered animals who call these spaces home, that they are nurtured and protected. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For broken systems we have inherited and continue to perpetuate, forgive us. Restrain the nations from fighting over limited resources. Redeem us from cycles of scarcity, suspicion, and violence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all who call upon your healing name, give rest. Comfort family and friends who wait with the sick and dying. Empower medical professionals with compassion and skill. Protect them from contagion and keep them strong. Walk with all those who are hungry, friendless, despairing, or desiring healing in body and spirit. And we pray especially for those on our congregation's prayer list. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I invite you now to offer prayers for those special to you. Create in our hearts a yearning to rest in your promise of eternal and resurrected life. Give us thankful hearts for those who have died, even as we look forward to the hope of new life with you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With bold confidence in your love, Almighty God, we place all for whom we pray into your eternal care. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the one who brought forth Jesus from the dead raise you to new life, fill you with hope, and turn your mourning into dancing. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Go in peace. Share the good news. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. <laughs>